So tonight's webinar consists of a series of shorter talks delivered by the following people. So firstly, we have Alistair Barclay. Alistair is Cotswold Archaeology's Principal Post Excavation Manager in our Andover office and has lived and worked on and off in Oxfordshire since 1990. He's he managed the post excavation analysis and publication stage of the Children Warren project. He's a specialist in prehistory and has worked on numerous Oxfordshire projects, most notably the Uffington White Horse and its Hill Fort. And then after Alistair, we have Paolo. So Paolo Guarino is an assistant post excavation manager at Cotswold Archaeology 2, and he's based in our Kemble office. He's worked in British commercial archaeology for 20 years, directing projects in southern England, as well as Italy and Turkey. His academic interests include social complexity and, or, and equality in prehistoric Turkey and Mesopotamia, and has published a number of papers. Paolo led the excavation at Childry Warren and had the rare opportunity to see this project through from the beginning to the end. And lastly, we've got Sharon Clough. Sharon is a human remains specialist at Cotswold Archaeology and has worked with human remains on a variety of projects all over the UK for more than 20 years. Her little known fact was that she was once a digger on an episode of Time Team. And then also another person of the team who you can't see behind the scenes is Indy Jago. So our tech support for this evening is managed by Indy and she is Cotswold Archaeology's Assistant Outreach and Community Engagement Officer. So thanks very much, Indy. Again, for those of you who have just joined us, please note that human remains will be shown during this evening's webinar. So, uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Alistair and the first of this evening's talks about the archaeology of the Childry Warren Pipeline. I'm Alistair. I'm going to introduce the project and talk uh, about the early prehistoric. Now, the reason for the title uh, for both the talk this evening and also the project, uh, and more to the point, publication in the shadow of Segsbury, and you can see our recent publication on the left here, uh, is because the work took place uh, in the Vale beneath the chalk downs and beneath the Iron Age hill fort. For those of you not familiar with the, the area, the Iron Age hill fort of Segsbury Camp, which sits right above the Scarp Slope uh, and looks the vale and back across the downs. Uh, our work follows on from Oxford, Oxford University's excavation, research excavations at Segsbury Camp. And it follows on 20 years after their, their work took place in the 1990s. Uh, and in a way, in many ways, uh, our own work complements, uh, our own work based on commercial archaeology complements the results uh, found during the research excavation. And we'll hear more of that as, as we run through the talk. Just to locate us, uh, the downs are to the south here. We have the Ridgeway. Uh, we're right on the edge of Oxfordshire here, almost into to Bark almost into the county of Berkshire. Uh, Sigsbury Camp is here, and then this right red line marks the six-kilometer pipeline uh, route of the pipeline. Uh, along which we excavated. Uh, the site itself is in the, the Vale of the White Horse, uh, Uffington, and the horse itself is over to the west. Uh, Wantage, the nearest town, uh, is just here, and Sigsbury Camp just to the south. So as you can see, the, the route of the pipeline runs just below the hill fort here. Uh, now, whenever we do these linear schemes, uh, a great amount of survey work goes into where the route is, is going to be placed. Uh, the route itself was uh, a water pipeline, uh, and the, the project uh, 
was funded by Thames Water. Now, before anybody went into the field to do some excavation, a great amount of survey took place. Uh, and this helps design the route uh, and also avoid where we can uh, known archaeological sites. Uh, and this is fairly standard practice. Uh, the type of survey includes geophysical, uh, aerial survey, and known archaeological sites from previous previous work and previous records. And you'll see more of that uh, later on in the talk in, in greater detail. The other thing, odd thing about the scheme is along its length, uh, most of the early prehistoric archaeology was found to the east, uh, and in general, this was fairly sparse. And then later prehistoric uh, Iron Age and Roman settlements were, were found more over here. I'm going to talk uh, next about Site 2, which is, is just here. So I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the Mesolithic and Neolithic sites. Now, the Mesolithic period runs from about 10,000 years ago, or 10,000 BC, uh, down to about 4,000 BC, and the Neolithic from 4,000 BC down to 2,400. Uh, and for those not familiar with these periods of prehistory, uh, during the Mesolithic, people were hunter-gatherers, and the Neolithic marks uh, the introduction of farming uh, in, into Britain at, at about 4,000 BC. Now, the traces we found of these periods were, were on the whole quite sparse, and it, it is actually quite rare to find such uh, traces and and more so in quite a narrow pipeline the pipeline uh, as you can see on the left here apart from areas of excavation uh, where we put various compounds uh, it's no more than five or ten meters across across this is one of the sites site two where we found uh, a concentration of evidence and I'm going to talk briefly about two types of features. Uh, the green circles uh, mark various large and small pits and a structure over here and a possible set, second structure. Within, within this area, most of the archeological material consisted of worked flint of Mesolithic and early Neolithic date. Uh, as well as the flint, there were a very occasional sherds of pottery and also a few pieces of animal bone. Now, when we first uncovered this site, we thought maybe we were dealing with a series of uh, pit deposits. But upon excavation, we actually realized nearly all of these features are what we refer to as tree throw holes, or what we understand to be tree throw holes. And in the diagram here, it explains how these features are created. They're normally created either through the, the ring barking or felling of trees, or where autumn storms or gales blow trees over. And unlike pits, these have a very distinct uh, sequences of fillings. So as the tree topples over, you end up with quite an asymmetric or filling within the, the hollow. And you can see that if you look down here, uh, the, the falling of the tree has uprooted uh, natural chalk, which has filled this bit, leaving a hollow, which then subsequently gets filled in often with, with loose soil. Now, the interesting things about these tree throw holes 
in the Mesolithic and later periods, they're sometimes used uh, to deposit uh, rubbish in or where particular objects were placed. And a couple of examples of what was found. Uh, this here is a, a red deer antler. This is a shed antler of a red deer. Uh, we know this is a Mesolithic date because we radiocarbon dated this to about six and a half thousand uh, BC. We also found Mesolithic flints in this feature. And our interpretation is that this isn't simply surface material that's fallen in. It's more likely to be material that's been placed within the, the feature. Now, I'm also going to talk about uh, a structure. Also, so in this in this area, we've got this group of tree throw holes. Some we know are of Mesolithic date. They're not all of the same dates. What what we're probably looking at here is an area of mostly woodland and trees that have fallen over a period of of several thousand years. This large tree throw here. Uh, had a piece of what's called aurochs or wild cattle bone. Uh, this was dated to about 3000 BC, uh, so approximately the, the end of the, the Middle Neolithic. Uh, so what we do know from the material coming out of these features, they're not all of the same date. What we also found on this site was a possible structure, uh, very little material. This was a, a wooden post-built structure. We've interpreted this as a building of about seven meters in length and five meters across. There's a possibility of, of a further structure just to the south. Now we actually found very little material in this structure, but we did find a few worked flints uh, from some of the fills of the post holes and the features inside. Now, we're not sure that this is actually of, of Neolithic date uh, because there is there's so little uh, material. Uh, so if our interpretation is correct, then our building does resemble other early Neolithic structures there's one here from the Middle Thames Valley at Horton, uh, which is also about five and seven metres. Uh, two, two other structures from Derbyshire also of similar size. Now, I think buildings are, are very rare, uh, and therefore this is, is quite a, an important discovery, if indeed it's, it's of Neolithic date. But as I say, most things on this site appear to be of Neolithic and Mesolithic dates. One of the other features we found along the routes was a series of what are referred to as grooved ware pits. Uh, these, we, we only found a, a small number of these pits scattered over the, the route. But for, certainly for the Vale, they're, they're important discoveries. Very little of this type of material is known uh, from, from the veil. Uh, these pits all had bits of pottery in them. They're, they're referred to as, as grooved ware simply uh, because most of the pottery is decorated with, with grooved decoration, as you can see on these sherds here. Uh, now, the interesting thing about grooved ware, it's a type of pottery that's first made in settlements on Orkney uh, around about 3200 BC. It then, it is then adopted and along with uh, other things such as stone circles and other types of monuments uh, are introduced across Britain and Ireland. Uh, and this particular type of pottery is the, the actual styles referred to as, as Dorrington walls, a massive henge enclosure uh, or ceremon ceremonial enclosure near to Stonehenge. So 
when this pottery was being deposited in these pits, uh, other big ceremonial sites like Avery and Stonehenge and the Devil's Kreutz in the, the Upper Thames Valley were, were being constructed and, and used. Now, such pits are, are not simply rubbish pits. Uh, these pits are thought to be, or, or rather the contents, we, we often just find uh, bits of broken objects. And one possibility is these pits mark uh, the abandonment of, of settlements, settlements that were, were probably seasonally occupied. Uh, other interesting finds from the pits include a, a scallop shell, which uh, not a, a fossil shell, but a marine shell that must have been collected uh, in a coastal area. Uh, we also have more bits of wild cattle bone, uh, again, or rock from from a couple of these pits. Now, aurochs themselves, uh, they became extinct in, in Britain by the end of the, the Bronze Age, by about 1000 BC. Uh, but these wild cattle that had, had roamed Britain since the end of the Ice Age uh, were a lot bigger than uh, modern day cattle and would have been quite scary uh, animals uh, to, to confront and, and to hunt, uh, and almost certainly were, were driven to, to extinction uh, because of the, the danger and hazards they, they presented. Now, after the, the Neolithic, we, we have very little evidence until the, the late Bronze Age. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Paolo, who's going to pick up the story with the, the end of the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all see my screen at this stage. Um, my, um, as um, as um, Alistair said, I'm going to start, to, I'm going to talk about the um, remains uh, found along the route that postdated the Neolithic. And um, we didn't find any uh, remains datable to the Bronze Age. And um, the earliest remains after the Neolithic was a uh, um, late Bronze Age, perhaps, but uh, more um, um, confidently uh, early Iron Age. Um, now, uh... The first uh, um, one one of the things um, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to comment on regarding um, the excavation of large pipelines like this is that they offered a unique opportunity to open a um, very uh, uh, wide area. And across the area, they offered the possibility to see how um, the landscape and um, was uh, changed um, and um, and how differently it was used over time. Um, just to um, pick up from where Alistair left it, um, the first. Uh, um, site I wanted to mention um, was a uh, site too, which is uh, where uh, the same site where we uh, found uh, Mesolithic and Neolithic um, pre pro holes and, um, and uh, postals. Now, following the felling of these trees, the clearance of the trees that must have been in this area, um, we um, and, and the abandonment of these possible structures that we're seeing with Alistair, uh, a very different type of feature um, was constructed, was built, was created in this area, uh, namely um, um, a boundary, uh, what we call um, a pit alignment. In this case, is a double pit alignment. As you see on the screen, we are looking at a series of pits um, 
excavated approximately three meters from um, from each other on um, from uh, from the two lines and about a meter twenty a meter fifty from from each pit. And um, now these uh, uh, was. Uh, um, it's a type. It's a type of feature. That it's associated. It's normally associated with um, with the boundaries. It's not quite a, um, a ditch in a bank, but we suspect it must have had uh, um, a similar kind of function in the sense that um, the pit uh, the the pit alignment uh, was um, what we call now a permeable boundary in the sense that probably i mean it is possible that animals and uh, humans were allowed to move either side uh, um, of the pit alignments however we don't know whether these pits created well with a uh, with a um, soil that came out of these pits it was uh, uh, a continuous bank was created perhaps with an edge row growing on top of it we um we are not able to tell as there was no evidence of such bank um what we know for sure is that compared to what was here before um these uh, um feature the, the pit alignment must have represented quite um remarkable um uh, mark in the landscape it definitely must have been um uh, visible from a distance is in the middle of a plain with the ridge um with the ridge line just running to the south of it now when we found uh, these um pit alignment uh, you can see here during excavation um we thought it was aligned uh, um it was pointing at it was aligned with uh, hill fort of um Sexbury castle but at um at a um, more careful um uh, look we realized that it was actually pointing almost straight south towards uh, uh towards the ridge um nonetheless what remains interesting is the fact that um i mean these um these features obviously by creating a boundaries must have uh, um separated might have separated territories belonging to different different groups of people and perhaps they um were used um by the different groups in uh, occasion where they got together and um they and they met in uh, in this uh, liminal space now one of the reasons why um i'm saying this is because the um only feature in this area that was clearly um dated to the um, to the um, early iron age was uh, a pit that was a relatively isolated um, pit that was found uh, not far from uh, the pit alignment that is here marked by the, the green band. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was quite unusual for its composition. It wasn't particularly large, but it contained a very, a relatively large amount of um, pottery that is um, illustrated here. Um, so almost uh, five uh, almost uh, uh, complete vessels, um, which were um, built, constructed in um, relatively um, rough uh, clay, not particularly well refined, and uh, uh, according to the um, lipid analysis that were carried out um, on the internal surface of these vases, these pots might have not been used at all, which made us think that perhaps they were created for the purpose of being buried in this pit. And this, uh, this brings me back to the idea that perhaps this area, this, this boundary um, between different areas, between different um, um, groups of people might have been used um, for ceremonial purposes, uh, or perhaps the meeting between these people were marked by this kind of um, no, small ceremonies where structured the positions like this uh, uh, in this pit um, were created. Now, this is um, clearly not um, a domestic con context. Um, 
we seen uh, um, um, we seen uh, uh, domestic remains remains of domestic uh, um, uh, areas further southwest along the route, and um, this is uh, now these uh, uh, red marks. Um, indicate the area where most of uh, uh, the uh, other Iron Age settlements were identified. As you can see, is just across the valley to the northwest of the Sexbury um, Hill Fort, and um, they were initially. This area was, uh, um, let's say, immediately identified as an interesting area by the geophysics survey that, as Alistair said earlier, was carried out in advance of um, of the excavation. Because of the, the identification of uh, um, all these um, anomalies that you see here is in, um, in uh, bright um, purple, red and blue colors, uh, the uh, pipeline uh, was actually um, rerouted in order to av avoid for as much as possible disturbance to these remains. Um, <clears throat> now, based uh, partly on uh, uh, the survey and uh, partly on the results of the excavations, um, five or oh, what, well, three sites were identified in this area. Um, two, um, were characterized by the um, by circular anomalies, as you see here, and down here is less visible. It'll be more visible in the next slide. Um, and they were, um, and it was uh, hypothesized that uh, uh, these might have been uh, um, settlements uh, characterized by roundhouses. Um, now the first one, the um, the the of these two settlements, site four and site five, the only one that we um had the opportunity to excavate uh, along the route uh, of the pipeline was site four. Now site four is um presented uh, remains that are quite um quite characteristic for uh, this period, for the um, Iron Age periods. Now, the, um, the site, uh, um, the dates that came from the site uh, uh, placed the site somewhere in Middle Iron Age, somewhere around 4th century um, BC. And um, the site was characterized by uh, the presence of uh, at least seven uh, possible roundhouses, which are marked by these ring gullies that you see here. The ring gullies are often interpreted as um, possible um, brick gullies uh, created to keep the the, um, the in interior of the structure drained, or perhaps in in other cases, perhaps in the case, for example, of these uh, uh, ring gullies is a bit uh, more substantial in size. Uh, they might have actually been structural, as in uh, it might have um, had um, the um, might have been the places where the posts were placed uh, for um, for the construction of the uh, main building itself. The other feature that is uh, fairly um, visible and um, um, fairly obvious from this image is are the these circular pits here. Now the pits are again a very very typical features of um, all uh, Iron Age sites in southern England at least and uh, another uh, feature that is characteristic of these area of, of these um, Iron Age sites um, are the so-called four posters. So you see one example here which uh, are often interpreted as possible remains of um, of um, areas or kind of platform rise platform to um, to store food, store um, plants, and um, or other kind of uh, other kind of um, food matter. Now, this is um, um, as I was saying, is a 
fairly typical of the Iron Age occupation uh, uh, in this area. And um, on in on the this image on the left and bottom left left hand side, uh, I wanted to show you what um, these ditches and uh, pits looked in from uh, when during the excavation. Um, this is a relatively was a relatively easy. Uh, uh, part of the site to excavate because uh, uh, the darker features were qu quite uh, well visible against the um, uh, lighter chalk um, uh, base, um, natural background. Um, an interesting thing about this particular feature, which is a, um, a photograph of this roundhouse uh, taken from the north, is uh, um, that it shows uh, some possible internal features, features that were possibly internal to the roundhouse itself, because obviously one of the problems we have when, when we excavate this kind of um, this kind of site is that we are never quite 100% sure about the relationship between um, the pits and the ring at least. We uh, sometimes, like in this case and in this case, see direct relationship between the different ring gullies because uh, they are intercutting each other and therefore we can um, with a certain level of confidence say that one gully came after the abandonment of an earlier one but for the, when the pits are not directly related to the um, um, to the gullies or to other features it's impossible to tell uh, exactly uh, their chronological relationships um, it is possible that they were related to the main round uh, houses. Um, and this is one of the cases, for example, this pit is um, quite interesting. It's relatively shallow, but it was lined with, um, with clay, entirely lined with clay. And it was surrounded by these five post holes that might have um, hold some kind of uh, lighter structure. Um, now, the the clay is not part of the natural substrate here, and um, so it was brought over here intentionally, perhaps uh, to, to line uh, the pit for specific functions. On um, on these other on this picture, I just want to show the those who are not familiar with what a roundhouse might have looked like uh, um, a recent reconstruction. Um, as I said earlier, these are extremely um, uh, frequent features in the Iron Age uh, of this uh, area. And this is an example. This is a, a, a trench excavated inside Sexbury um, Hill Fort. And I, um, I wanted to show it just because uh, it, I think it's remarkable. Um, the similarities between the two sides uh, are remarkable and it's just to prove that um, my point of um, how frequent this kind of um, features are. And also to um, remind us that uh, these occupation, these are an age occupation on this side of the valley, just to the northeast of the of the Sexbury Castle, probably suggest that um, these people, the people, the, the community that created this site, these settlements, probably had uh, um, a part in the creation, in the construction of the. Um, of the castle of the of the hill fort uh, just on the other side of the valley and uh, obviously again we are not 100 percent sure we can't prove this in any way but there is no reason um, but is a remain a, a reasonable um, hypothesis um now as i was saying earlier the pits are ubiquitous in iron age sites and um they come in all shapes and forms the most uh, um frequent ones are um are as you see in this uh, in, the, in this image uh, between a meter and a meter and a half uh, um, uh, wide and tend to be of different uh, uh, depth Ten, and they're mostly, uh, well, often interpreted as uh, um, storage pits, pits used to store grains or other kind of harvest uh, and uh, at the end of their lives were um, used uh, 
as rubbish pits to dispose of domestic waste or, or any sort. But as you can imagine, there are um, different pits that were used in different ways, and we can't really um, always tell exactly um, the difference. There are in this in these pictures just a just a sample of uh, some of the interesting pits that we had. This one, for example, had um, what it looks like a large postal at the base of the pit. Might have been some kind of totem, might have been some, or, or simply another smaller pit at the base of it. Um, and this pit was particularly interesting because uh, it had uh, human remains scattered along this side uh, just to prove um, a different uh, use of, um, of these uh, pits after their possibly original use as storage pits. Some of them had uh, animal skulls like horses and cows um, buried uh, in them, uh, perhaps uh, as um, some kind of closure ritual, we can't tell. Some other had, as I said earlier, evidence of domestic waste, like uh, broken tools, like this bone spatula and these um, bone um, points, broken points or needles. Um, another uh, very, as, as I mentioned earlier, some of these pits uh, had uh, some um, burial, uh, some um, human burials in it. And um, again, this is not unusual for uh, uh, Iron Age pits across the country, but um, in some cases we come across uh, very particular um, burials. In this particular case, we had uh, uh, a pit with three burials. Um, at the top of the pit was a uh, um, um, human, the, the body where the remains of a um, human individual. Um, um, I, won't, I won't go into the details uh, of, um, of, of um, the bones analysis as my colleague Sharon will talk about it in detail later on. But as you can, as you can see uh, by yourself, the position of uh, uh, the body is quite unusual and attracted quite a lot of attention. Uh, the interesting thing, apart from the splayed legs, is the fact that the feet have been removed um, from the original position and they've been placed next to the chest, whilst the um, hands appeared were found uh, to the top of uh, the head, almost as if it had been tied behind the head like that. Now, below this body, when we removed uh, the skeleton below, uh, um, we found the remains of um, articulated remains of a dog. And below that, we found the remains uh, of a child, of a very small child. Now, what I, as I said, the details of the bone remains will be discussed later on by my colleague. But what is interesting to uh, consider here is um, how much attention uh, must have gone into the creation of this structure at the position. This is clearly an intentional and very ritualized deposition. And um, and I think it's useful to have a, to keep in mind when we look at uh, just another Iron Age pits. They, these pits were clearly um, quite a lot more than just um, storage pits, and it is probably impossible to identify uh, the function of each single pit as um, um, as is proven by this case. To go back to the to our uh, settlements now, um, to the northeast of uh, the settlements I just talked about um, along the route, we found uh, um, more evidence of Iron Age occupation. Uh, you see possible remains of another roundhouse here that was truncated by this long ditch, uh, which was partly identified during the uh, by the geophysics survey, as you see by this uh, line here. Now, this ditch is particularly interesting um, because it uh, has um, it contains pottery that dates from the early Iron Age, so potentially earlier than the settlements that we saw earlier on. Um, but it, 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 it seems to be reused for a very long time, um, as is shown by the next uh, um, slide. 
So this is the ditch I was showing you earlier. And uh, we we noticed that, it, especially by looking at um, the results, of, uh, by combining the results of the geophysics survey with uh, the results of our excavation, that this ditch uh, was uh, englobated and included within a much uh, uh, wider um, set of uh, ditch and enclosures uh, and, uh, and boundaries that formed, in many cases, a series of enclosures. Um, now, some of them are just uh, um, were just observed uh, on the juicy from the results of the geophysical analysis. Uh, some of them were also um, uh, seen during the excavation. And uh, we um, we were able to um, date some of these ditches to the um, to the Roman period, um, and uh, we uh, interpreted these remains as the remains of a Roman farmstead. And um, here you got um, the more detailed plan of the excavation area, the main excavation area, which included uh, uh, the Roman remains. Um, some of these ditches, as I was showing earlier, uh, were part of uh, larger enclosures, possibly with trackways in between. These kind of trackways, again, are relatively um, frequent in this kind of farmstead, and they were probably used to um, you know, facilitate movements of animals, of, of uh, livestock from uh, one enclosure to another for different purposes, etc. Interesting um, find in, in an interesting um, element of this excavation is the fact that despite finding several um, um, elements uh, suggested uh, that there were structures and dwellings nearby, we didn't find any evidence of it of structural remains uh, on site. Um, on on in these uh, images here, you can see some of the um, very well preserved objects that we found and that were dated uh, to a Roman period. At the towards the end of the Roman periods, um, was dated one of the um, most interesting uh, features of uh, our excavation. We um, at the south end of the area of Roman uh, occupation, um, we found the remains of a cemetery. As you see, um, as you see from the pictures here, we had a number of burials uh, that were. Um, all uh, cut within uh, um, quite deep within the the chalk substrate. Some of them had um, um, very interesting lining created with the same um, chalk stones that were excavated from the pits, and uh, and they were placed to line um, the um, the grave cut. And in some cases, there were also some large slabs were also covering the um, and the human remains within the grave itself. Um, <clears throat> again, like I said earlier, for the Iron Age uh, human remains, my colleague Sharon will talk more in details about the uh, analysis done on the um, on these uh, remains. Um, what I'd like to highlight here is um, the fact that some of these um, some of these burials contained uh, some interesting grave goods. You see in this picture here um, a small bracelet. In this one, I hope it's visible enough uh, for you. Um, it is um, a coin uh, that was placed right inside the mouth uh, uh, of the um, of this individual. Um, and uh, here we have uh, a ring, a photograph of a ring that is still sitting in. Um, on the finger of these other individual had uh, examples of uh, coins and, and uh, finger rings found uh, in the graves here. Um, one of the objects that def definitely um, um, you know, it, it was is considered remarkable for its rarity is a bone comb that was found, as you see from this picture, um, Right at the back of the skull of one of the um, of one of the individuals buried in this cemetery. Now, the interesting thing about 
these uh, um, bones, is, uh, these um, bone comb, is that this is only one. It's one of only six that have been found in this country, and um, as you can see, is a uh, quite complex um, constructions and includes a set of decorations on the main panels. And as well as a, a, a figurine of possibly a horse um, that were carved in the in the middle area between the two um, the two parts of the comb. Um, an interesting um, um, another interesting thing about this comb is the fact that it was a uh, break broken um, before was placed in the um, in the grave suggesting that these was still in use despite the fact that it was broken and uh, whether it was broken ritually broken before uh, the burial um, occurred or whether it was still in use because it was considered valued valuable object despite the fact that you that it was broken in either case quite remarkable Finally, um, the last, uh, the latest uh, evidence of occupation we come we came across during the excavation includes a much smaller uh, cemetery area, uh, much smaller cemetery in the northern part of uh, what we call Site Six, which was effectively the, the main Roman occupation. And um, in fact, these uh, was um, these burials were. Uh, all found without any grave goods, and we assumed at the beginning that were also part of the um, Roman occupation of the area. And instead, um, but instead, uh, um, radiocarbon analysis proved that they were of Saxon uh, origin, which obviously ties in with uh, origins of uh, local villages like uh, Leckham Bassett and uh, Leckham Ridges. I will now pass. Uh, um, the board to my colleague Sharon Clough, who will uh, um, um, talk about uh, human human remains analysis. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, thank you, Carlo, uh, for introducing all those different sites to us. Um, so yes, I'm going to go through and discuss the human remains that we got from those various sites, starting with the Iron Age, going through to the Roman, and then lastly to the Saxon that you've just heard about. There we go. And so starting with the Iron Age, as I discussed before, the three pits there in red were uh, where we found human remains. Now, the Iron Age um, we're talking about here in particular is the Middle Iron Age, which that's about 2100 to 2400 years ago. Um, and as already discussed, these were all in these pits, but the thing in the Iron Age is we don't actually know where the majority of people were disposed of. So the fact that we're finding these individuals in the pits means that they're already exceptional. So these are the exceptions to the norm. Um, and as Paolo's described, they can be in these pits with other domestic debris. They can be found at the bottom, the middle or the top of the pit. And um, these are some of the individuals that we had. So in two of the pits, we had uh, two children, or one as a neonate. Um, SK 1808 there is actually a sort of an older child, aged about 12 to 13 years when they died. Now, the body was placed into the pit to one side after a couple of fills had already accumulated. So there was some already stuff in the pit when this child was put in. And then the pit was then recut after the body had been covered. So that's why it looks a little bit jumbled up there. Um, it has been interfered with later. Um, the result means that we didn't have all of the remains to have a look at, um, but it was probably likely to be originally in the crouched position, which is quite normal for the period. And then skeleton 1834, uh, as discussed, is a little neonate that was at the base of it, uh, the base of the pit laid on its right side, again in a crouched position. And included in with this was a very large front nodule, which placed next to the head, and two pig teeth. Uh, were at the lower end. So these were obviously placed in intentionally um, along with the little baby. So these are both quite sort of typical for the period um, in the, and I say carefully placed in a crouch position at, at different levels. But and because of the young age, um, there wasn't much on the bones I could tell you. I couldn't tell you how they died or anything like that. And we didn't find any changes due to trauma or disease. 
So moving on to this more exceptional burial that we came across. So um, as you can see, the body position was quite unusual, possibly, you know, even shocking to some people considering uh, some of the headlines that we had in the news about it. However, if you start to understand it um, in terms of sort of compared to other ones in the area and what is sort of more typical for the period, some of the elements aren't actually as unusual as they first appear. And you also have to take into account what we call taphonomy, which is the movement of bones after death. So sometimes how you see something in the ground isn't actually always how it went in in the first place. But there are some unique elements, as Paolo said. We have the feet here up by the chest them here where they've been taken off the feet here and then up and over the hands together here suggestive that they are maybe tightly bound um, in order to keep them and the arm is going up and over and as I said more typical for the Iron Age period would be to find somebody in a much more um, crouched position um, in the grave. So when I did the analysis on this individual, they were an adult female uh, of aged about 25 to 29 years old. And we got, as I said, we got a radiocarbon date from one of the rib bones, um, putting it in about 362 to 196 uh, BC. She was about uh, 160 centimetres or five foot three uh, tall, uh, an, an estimate. And being a young female, again, wasn't expecting too much uh, disease or injury, things that you tend to accumulate over time. So it was quite interesting that on the left and the right tibia, that's the lower legs, there was a layer of um, peristitis. So that's an active infection that was still in, in existence when she died. It's quite a common site for infection is the lower leg. The skin's very thin there. Um, it can be easily knocked or get something like ulcers. Uh, but peristitis like that can also be indicative of something more systemic, something more going on in the rest of the body, some sort of disease. But unfortunately, there was no other evidence anywhere else of anything going on. So um, we just have to leave it as what we call a non-specific indicator. So looking around the area or other regional practices going on, we have the site at Spring Road in Abingdon. And as you can see there, this individual is also in a cross-legged position. So the fact that our female is in that position, you know, it doesn't actually now look as unusual. And there are other examples of this position as well. But what was unusual is the removal of the feet. So you can see on this slide, I've got both the lower legs there on the right and the uh, ankle. These are the ankle bones and the bottom of the leg here. And you can see it's all jagged and irregular. There's no indication anywhere of uh, sore marks or cut marks. And this irregular sort of edge would suggest that actually the feet have maybe more been snapped or broken off rather than using any kind of tool. But you can speculate as to why the feet were removed. Um, you know, obviously the obvious thing is to sort of prevent walking. But what you need to also understand is that in the Iron Age, it was much more common to interfere with the head. The head was much had much more prominence and importance, and we frequently find bits of skull um, and cranium and things in pits and ditches, you know, just, just little bits of them all over the place, and that's very, very common finding. So why in this instance they're more interested in the feet is, is quite unusual. And trying to have a look around to see if anyone else has found this uh, anywhere else in the archaeology in Britain, and I only managed to find one example in County Roscommon in Ireland, where the right foot of a male had been removed, who'd been laid prone in a circular enclosure. And then an example in Dorset at West Noyle, a late Iron Age young male uh, had also had both feet removed uh, and placed onto the chest in a quite a similar manner. So this places it as quite an unusual burial in the fact that these feet have been removed, as I say, because it's so much more common to have the head interfered with. And we really wanted to find out more about this individual. So we had a look at their isotopes. So these are the little bits of information that we have inside our bones and teeth. And they relate when it comes to the teeth as to where you grew up when you were a child. It's to do with the drinking water, when the geology that the water was coming off um, is set into your adult teeth as they develop when you're a child, sort of between sort of two and eight years old. And 
we had a look at these for this uh, particular individual to see if they were local to the area of the Ridgeway. Um, and very interestingly, the oxygen isotope, it was a very low value. And this tells us that she must have come from somewhere in eastern um, England, somewhere with a low rainfall area, as we call it. Um, and in fact, the, the, the result was really, really low, um, placing them possibly not even within England. But if you take into account some sort of errors and things, um, it did bring it back into that area. However, the strontium suggested chalk. Um, and obviously, the Ridgeway is chalk. But so are all these areas. So all of these highlighted in red and blue are all chalk parts of the country. So if you combine the two bits of information, the strontium and the oxygen together, it would suggest that they were probably from somewhere east of England and on chalk, which leaves you know quite a sort of large combination of areas, but sort of either southeast Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, or the east of England. And so that means that this individual was born there and brought up and moved uh, at some point after their teeth uh, had, de had developed after the, about, say, the age of about nine or ten. We also had a look at the diet, what they were eating. Um, and with diet, it tends to be more of an average over the last ten years. And when the, there was a slight problem with the veils, because we've got different geology there, you've got the chalk highland, um, chalk upland, and then you've got down in the vale, you've got more um, clay and things. It, it, it's for harder to interpret these results because we're relying on where you're getting your food from. So if they were getting their food um, mostly from the Ridgeway, then they had a good portion of animal protein. But if they were getting their food mostly from the Vale, uh, they were probably mostly vegetarian. Um, and we currently just don't quite have enough animal data to compare this with in order to understand the diet a little bit better. So as Paolo mentioned, this pit actually already had a burial in it. Uh, so this very little baby had been interred into the pit. Uh, they were about one to two years old um, and they'd been put in there long before uh, the lady had. And we know this because we did the radiocarbon dating and there must have been at least 18 years between these two burials. So there is some knowledge, some memory that that's gone in first. Then there's the layer with the anal bone, and then there's the final one in the top. Um, so, you know, it may be it's, that it's been specifically chosen for the reason that the baby was in there. And we wanted to know if there was some relationship between those two. And we did try the ancient DNA, but unfortunately it failed. Uh, there wasn't enough um, preserved uh, in order to be able to do that analysis. So. And for, we will just never know um, if there's any kind of genetic relationship between the two. So there were some more Iron Age burials a little further away. There were two more on site six. These are possibly contemporary with the ones we've just been looking at or earlier. Uh, the radiocarbon dates are quite wide. Um, and these were much, much more typical for the period. So these are your, um, they're located just here. And they're your nice tightly crouched burials. We're assuming these were in the bottom of a pit. Uh, they were truncated, so they lost the heads uh, and all the pits sort of disappeared. So what we're seeing is right down at the base there. And one was a 25 year old male and the other was a child, six to nine years old. So moving on to the Roman period, uh, as Paolo said, we had this nice little cemetery on site six uh, down here in the bottom and you can see it, it sort of has a lovely view <laughs> down the hill there. Um, this is dated uh, late Roman, which is you know a typical time to have an inhumation cemetery. Um, and we had 19 individuals out of 16 um, graves. So they were quite typical for the period. They're laid out on their backs, uh, each in their own little grave, say apart from there was there were three neonates that were placed in with adults. Um, and we had f only of the adults, only five were male and 11 were female. So we've got a huge discrepancy there. There were no children, um, as I say, apart from the neonates. And there was also nobody under the age of 25. So it goes from neonate, nothing, then above 25. So 
don't know where these um, individuals are missing from the sort of child, adolescent, early adulthood period. Um, maybe they're buried somewhere else because you would expect there to be some people dying in that age category. Um, of the um, adult males, none of them were, were young, they were all older. There was only the females that were in what we call the prime adult category, which is 25 to 35. Now, interestingly, in the Roman period, it is much more typical to find more males in a cemetery than females. And what we have here at Childry is a completely reverse of that. Um, and then when you're looking at what all sort of ailments and diseases and injuries they've got, these were all things which, were, again, were quite typical for the period, indicating a lot of, sort of hard work and then other injuries and ailments relating to old age. So there was nothing that particularly stood out for that reason. Um, so, yeah, as I said, you've got um, neonates buried with an adult. Um, more commonly in the Roman period, neonates are buried around buildings. Um, so maybe that's where some of the children are. But they obviously felt the need that they had to be accompanied um, with an adult when they went into the ground. This individual here is um, the decapitation burial. Again, this is quite a common finding in Roman period cemeteries. We don't know why this was practiced. It wasn't necessarily for a bad reason. It might be to give them some extra thing, maybe to release the soul, for example. This individual was an older adult male. Um, the skulls there, you can see them being placed down by the feet. There wasn't, uh, unfortunately, enough preservation in the spine, so I can't tell you exactly which vertebra um, it was removed at or any indication of how that took place. Uh, it did, just those bones didn't survive me to have a look at. So it's a nice, neat little cemetery. You've got two different orientations of burials there. Um, and as I say, you've got a, a mix of male, a few males to a lot of females and, and no children. And one of the questions we really wanted to know is, is, does this represent a family cemetery? Are these people related? And what's brilliant is we now have ancient DNA and it's completely revolutionized our knowledge. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite as straightforward and simple as sending off our samples to ancestry.com or other companies are available, it's a lot more complicated, um, especially due to DNA degradation from the time of, you know, long time they've been in the ground, and we get a lot more in limited information. However, um, the Scotland Ancient Genomics Lab at the Crick Institute in London are running a fantastic project called the Thousand Ancient Genomes, and they very kindly sampled um, eight of these individuals for us. And the results are, have been really exciting. And what we've got is we've got, of the, of the eight samples, six of them are all close relatives. So you can see here on this diagram, we try to simplify the um, results for you. Um, so at the top here, we have uh, two sisters. This is family A, and they have the two sisters, and they are related to this guy, who also happened to be the one who was decapitated down here, and then related to this individual as well. And then we have family B, and these two are also first degree uh, relatives. When we say first degree, um, we mean parent or sibling, and second degree relatives are grandparent, grandchild, uncle, nephew, niece, aunt, nephew, niece. Uh, so that's slightly more um, distant relation. So this is really exciting um, results to get, and sort of, you know, proves what we've been thinking a long time about some of these cemeteries is that they are for families but what is also showing there is it's not just one side it's maternal and paternal relatives that are going in here and so that's really really great um, and the work is still going on at the Crick so we never know we might get even more information out of this uh, further down the line. Uh, so if anybody is interested in the actual sort of details about DNA I say it can be quite complicated we get these things called um, haplogroups and that's what these really long numbers mean so it indicates which one and this is like a sort of um, family tree that we created in order to give you that plan earlier and uh, if you can see uh, everybody there. We also had um, one individual SK2006 um, with some of this uh, mitochondrial um, information suggesting that the ancestry might be from southern Europe but that works still ongoing, we're still um, working that out, whether that's actually accurate or not. It doesn't necessarily mean they were from Southern Europe, it just means that somebody in some point in their family came from that part of the world. So moving on to the Saxon period, 
Um, we had seven skeletons uh, in that little area, that narrow strip uh, that you saw earlier. Um, unfortunately, as you can see from this photograph, the topsoil was very shallow. Uh, so it meant that quite a lot of these graves had got quite heavily truncated. So we lost a lot of information and possibly even some graves. So here they all are in yellow and you can see they're all on the same orientation. And it's quite possible that this was only the area of excavation was possible outside this area. There were other graves as well. So we might not have the full extent of this cemetery. We did the radiocarbon dating, as Paolo said, and this came out at 7th or um, mid to late 8th century. Um, and so they're surprising in that they don't have uh, grave goods really at this time. There was a high number of non-adults coming out of this number of individuals, a child, older child and an adolescent. And then all the adults, um, which were up the top here, these three, were all male. This is possibly a coincidence. It might not be a true kind of representation, uh, say due to all those factors that we don't have the full extent. What I just want to pick out is a couple of individuals from this site. So um, this is one of the better preserved ones, SK 1068. There's a prime adult male, so that's 25 to 35 years. Um, and he was 187 centimeters tall uh, as an estimate. So that's six foot one which when the mean for that time period in the Saxon time was 172 centimetres or five foot seven, he was significantly taller than everybody else. Um, and on top of this, he had an unusual ankle condition. So his two ankle bones here were actually both fused together. And this is called telecalcaneal coalition. Uh, it's relatively common and it's usually follow, you know, goes in families, it's sort of heritable and it results in stiff, painful feet, ridged flat foot, meaning that you have, you have difficulty walking on an even ground um, and usually becomes fused in your sort of late childhood, early teens. Um, so not only did he sort of stand out in his stature, he would have walked a little bit differently to everybody else as well. Um, so this is quite interesting. What was also interesting with these is we don't normally find that many injuries or ailments on children. Um, and this K10004 was an older child, about eight to 12 years old, and they had a fracture to the right clavicle and the scapula, so that's the shoulder area. And the fractures had healed um, and it, it reduced the length of that clavicle there um, by nearly a centimetre. But what was interesting was that on the scapula, and unfortunately you can't see it very well, is that there's um, some active infection still going on there. There's some periostitis, and it's probably secondary to the fracture that's occurred on the shoulder blade. Um, and it means it was still active at the time of death. And, and fractures in children can heal quite quickly, you know, three to six weeks. So it's quite likely that um, this was still active when they died and may have been some sort of contributing factor to their death. Now, there are surprisingly um, few Saxon burials are found in the area, given the origins uh, of many of the towns and villages. So when I was trying to look for some other sites to compare with, um, there really weren't very many. There's interestingly one from the Sexbury camp. Um, that was a secondary burial. It was put um, in, you know, obviously after the <laughs> camp had been um, created. And that was excavated in 1871. And it falls into this sort of common thing that we find in the Saxon period is they're reusing these earlier prehistoric monuments. And the same happened further down the road um, at Whitehorse Hill. There's some prehistoric barrows. And again, there were some Saxon burials put into those. Um, but other than that, there were just a few down in the Vale, found at West Hanny and Filford, um, and then one down at Longcott. So there aren't actually that many um, burials found from dating from the Saxon period in this area. So these few seven that we had here are actually contributing to our understanding of the Saxon life and burial in the Vale. So that's everything from me. I will hand you back uh, to Alistair. Uh, just to briefly conclude before we move on to a, a question and answer session through the chat. Uh, the scheme itself, the water pipeline, provided a, a great opportunity to look at a, a six kilometre slice through the Vale of the White Horse. Uh, and as we previously mentioned, near the Hillfall to Sexbury Camp. Uh, this has added uh, a great amount of information on the, the hinterland in an area of, of the Vale of the White Horse that is, is poorly understood and sees uh, 
little opportunity for for excavation or, or development leading to excavation. And as you've heard this evening, uh, despite the, the thinness uh, of our six kilometre trench, basically, we've uncovered human activity spanning, spanning about 7,000 years from the mid Mesolithic going back to about 6,500 BC to about the seventh or eighth century AD in the Saxon period. Uh, a range of discoveries, a uh, range of archaeology uh, is uh, quite surprising. Uh, it's added much local detail to, to local and regional detail to for the archaeology of Oxfordshire. Uh, some real national highlights, as we've just heard from Sh Sharon, uh, and the opportunity to uh, use some cutting edge science in the ADNA uh, that you've you've just heard about on the, the Roman burials in particular. And the Iron Age burial that both Paolo and Sharon described, uh, again, a discovery of uh, national interest, without a doubt. Uh, the legacy of the project, uh, the We've left uh, an important data set for future research. Uh, the results, as we started off uh, saying in the talk, are, are now published in, in one of our monographs. There's also information out there on, on social media and various news stories. Uh, the archive, all the material from the excavation is now deposited with Oxfordshire Museum Service and is available for, for future research. I would so that's just a very brief conclusion. We'll obviously come on to discuss aspects of the site in the, the question session that, that's going to follow this. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody who's listened to the webinar just now. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, the people of Letcom Bassett and Letcom Regis who have supported the, the scheme throughout uh, from the field and uh, subsequently. Uh, and, and not least our various partners and stakeholders. Uh, and finally, the many people who worked out on the excavations and during post-excavation who have helped produce the, the publication uh, and, and the, the story that we've heard tonight. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, um, for that fascinating, fascinating talk. Um, I find it really interesting how you've got that continuation of occupation over time um, uh, over the site and really fascinating to find out about those relationships between those individuals using that ancient um, DNA. So if I can ask our, our panel to um, to come on board and so that you can see all of us at the same time. Fantastic. So um, let's have a look at questions. Um, so from David, we've got a first question for Sharon here. Um, can you, in the future, use a comparison between the ancient DNA you found and see if there are any people in the local area with similar, similar lineage um, like they did with Cheddar Man? OK, right. Well, I have to... Uh... Confess, uh, I'm not a specialist in ancient DNA. Um, the, the main problem with looking at people from quite so long ago um, is that there's been a lot of genetic change over that time. And you, if you look at family trees and things like that, you find that you soon become um, related to an awful lot of different people over quite a, just a few hundred years. Um, you know, there is a sort of joke that everybody's related to William the Conqueror. So the further back you go, the, the wider and more vague it becomes. So um, it's actually very difficult to trace back a lot, much more than, say, two to three hundred years, any sort of direct lineage with with anybody. Um, what we do, what you can do is look at the mitochondrial DNA um, and again to see and that gets passed down the female line. Um, and that, you know, obviously continues on and you can see if there's a similarity between that um, and more recent people. 
Um, but we are finding with these large DNA studies that actually there's been quite considerable changes to that over time with large scale migrations going on. Um, so it's actually incredibly difficult to um, get this direct connection. And I think the work they did with, with Cheddar Man, um, <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was very, um, I don't know how to put it, <laughs> not necessarily um, as, as sort of simple as people understand that direct that there wasn't a direct connection shall we say between those people uh so but as I say it's not my area of specialism um and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of more information uh, online about all that brilliant thanks Sharon just to follow on from that uh, we've got another question um from Mark and um, would it be possible to contrast and compare the DNA between um Romano British and Anglo-Saxon remains yeah, well, it's interesting you should ask her. That is what the, the one of the things the Thousand Genomes Project at the Crick they're doing is they're looking at this change over time um, in our different, um, in our mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA. Um, so that's actually one of the aims of that project. And they've taken a lot of samples now and they're sort of crunching all the data. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll start seeing some of that, the results from that coming out. And yeah, we should be able to answer that question. Brilliant. Um, there are a few other questions um, for you as well, Sharon, but just for the moment, we're going to pop over to Alistair. So this one's been especially addressed for you, Alistair. What is the legal side of things, and Paolo as well, I'm sure. What is the legal side of things in the UK when pipelines, roads or buildings are erected in an archaeologically interesting place? Well, I think we, I think, as I said at uh, uh, the start of the talk there's always mitigation to try and avoid any archaeological remains uh, and certainly it it depends whether a site is scheduled or protected uh, in 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 this case there were no scheduled sites it's a bit of a it's a bit of a wide question uh, to answer but uh, it's certainly, um, I think it depends what they mean by legal, and they they probably need to be a bit more specific. I, I think, uh, but certainly, uh, every attempt is made to uh, avoid archaeological sites where possible, which we saw in, in the mitigation here. Uh, but that, you know, inevitably, archaeology or uh, construction is is destructive. Um, I'm I'm not sure I've answered the question there, but I, I don't know whether Paolo. Uh, I mean, on the legal side, there is a question of uh, ownership of the material, and that goes to the the landowner. Uh, we have to seek landowner consent uh, to deposit that material. Uh, with, with the museum, uh, which which we hope most landowners will do, but they don't have to. I don't know whether Paolo wants to add anything. Yeah, the only thing I want to say, just in case the, the person that asked the question is not familiar with the process in general, is that in, in the UK, in order to, yeah, to, to build something or dig in the ground or whatever you need to ask for planning permission and uh you get you might get planning permission at the conditions that you mitigate your impact the impact of your excavation your groundworks by in the case of archaeology perhaps paying for um um archaeological project whether it's an excavation an evaluation it, it that it it is decided uh, by the local planning authority, which will decide what kind of mitigation is necessary for the type of site. In the case of this pipeline, it was decided that the all uh, length of the pipeline was going to be um, watched in a watching brief by, as in, uh, why they were stripping the topsoil and the subsoil before reaching the natural ground, uh, the, the machines well, we needed to, to we as archaeologists from Cotswold Archaeology needed to uh, watch the machines and make sure that 
if there was anything, we were able to intervene immediately by marking the, the findings, etc. So that was the legal requirement for our client, in this case, um, Thames Water, um, for the archaeology to be recorded appropriately. Thanks, both. And just to follow on from that, uh, the, the same person uh, um, has asked, um, who pays for the excavation? In this case, it, it was paid for by uh, Thames Water, uh, and we were we were commissioned by them. Uh, the, there would have been a, a tendering process, uh, and we were therefore subcontracted uh, to do the work. Uh, and following uh, a whole set of national guidance uh, that that we have to follow, and and just going back to what Paolo mentioned about planning, one of the conditions is publication and deposition with the museum, so that uh, all the material uh, it, it's basically preservation by record. Uh, we make very detailed survey records and, and notes, photographs uh, of all the archaeology we uncover. That goes to the museum. Uh, our publication is is a, is a interpretation of those records. And as I said, all the all the artifactual material also goes to the museum so that it's publicly available uh, and available to other institutions for future research. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, going back to you, Sharon, um, David and Julie have asked any neonatal um, human remains in which general rubbish and animal bone um, something seen on other sites. Is there anything like that at all? Um, not on this site, no. So the neonates in the Roman period, they were all in a grave um, down by the legs of an adult. Um, we didn't really have a uh, settlement particularly uh, from the Roman period on this site. So we don't have any sort of rubbish areas. Um, so we didn't have any evidence of that, but it is it is something you, you do get, yeah. Thank you. Um, Alistair or, and or um, Paolo, I've got a question here from Alan. Um, are there plans to ex expand on the sites in the future as it seems there is a lot left unanswered? Only if there is future development or if somebody wants to conduct a further research uh, project. Uh, so certainly by ourselves, no. Uh, but if other opportunities come up, uh, the, you know, clearly we've added a great deal of knowledge uh, for our discoveries, uh, should anybody want to do future research or uh, certainly the information we've provided would now automatically feed into any other any other construction projects or developments in, in the area. But this is largely a, a rural landscape. So uh, I think any, any developments likely to be small scale in the immediate area. Thank you. Um, Paolo, over to you. What's the minimum length of the double pit alignment? Are there parallels known from other places? Right, yes. Um, the length of our um, pit alignment was about 120 metres. So we're looking at a very substantial um, boundary. And um, there are parallels. Um, there are several parallels that go from the new in in the UK at least that they are dated from the Neolithic up to the Iron Age. Uh, I, for what I've read, the Neolithic ones I never found a Neolithic one myself. Uh, um, appear to be um, more associated to the presence of posts. They're more like uh, the the, the la large post holes that might have hold. Uh, um, uh, a timber post in it and they tend to have uh, more fines in it whilst the uh, uh, bronze age late bronze age and early iron age pit uh, pits in the pit alignments tend to be barren like the ones we found very very little material evidence in them but yeah they're definitely they're definitely part of the prehistoric landscape in this country 
Fantastic. Um, I've got a follow up question just regarding those pits as well, please. Um, could the clay lined pit be associated with metalworking? Uh, it would be lovely to find out. We unfortunately there was no evidence of metalworking associated to the settlement. So the answer is it could be, but there was no evidence in the sense that uh, clearly the the clay line pit um, had a specific function. Um, sometimes there are, um, you know, we think that my might have been the clay lining might have um, been used to. Um, um, make the pit impermeable so to put water in it in some cases we know for example that um, water was um, heated with by putting hot stones inside um, containers with water and that pit with the clay lining might have um, created the right conditions to warm up water whether that was the case we don't know but yeah i mean we don't have evidence for metal work in the uh, in the settlement. Thank you. Um, Sharon, got a question for you from Di Davies. Um, in the Roman in Roman burials, most seemed north south, or a few, like the sisters possibly, were west east. Are they Christian or pagan? Um, well, we can't really uh, infer what people's sort of religious beliefs were um, from the orientation of their graves. Uh, that's something that we used to think. Uh, but it's not entirely clear now. Um, burials which are west-east can also do with the alignment with the rising and setting sun. Um, so this is not necessarily uh, an indication of their sort of, uh, whether they're Christian or pagan. Um, there were no artifacts or anything like that to suggest uh, that either. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't really tell uh, from that. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I've just got one last question, unless others come up. Um, from Philip, um, is there a way to determine whether the soil in the tree throws was from rotting trees or the trees had been completely removed? It, it depends really what survives in that. It, it would depend on the conditions uh, and what survives. Uh, to get bits of the roots, you would probably need... Uh, two, two conditions of preservation, either waterlogging, uh, which on the chalk is, is unlikely. Uh, occasionally when trees fall over, they also burn. Uh, I, we didn't have any evidence for this, but on other sites, if a fallen tree falls over, it it's obviously can be inconvenient. Uh, and one way is to then set fire to bits of it. If they set fire to it as well, as sort of chop up the, the tree or just let it rot. It will eventually rot if it's dead. Uh, but if they decide, if, if it's deliberate sort of uh, tree clearance uh, or if the tree falls over, if it's if it's actually set fire, then you might get bits of charred root uh, surviving and falling into the what's into the tree hole. If I can add one thing, we um, we did run, we did take samples from the um, free throw holes that we found on site, and unfortunately, the conditions weren't good enough. The preservation wasn't good enough to determine any any um, any particular evidence. But um, one thing that suggests that uh, the tree rotted at least for a period is that as Elio, uh, as Alistair showed in his um slides um is the sequence within uh, um uh, within the pit itself that shows there is not regular is not accumulated regularly or uh, by intentionally backfilling the pit it looks like the 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 tree might have, therefore some of the some of the um, roots uh, might have been within the hole as the tree was rotting away and perhaps when they weren't removed entirely thank you both um that's it for the questions um unless anyone else has got any questions to come in um and um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to everybody, to Alistair, to Paolo, to Sharon, to Indy, our tech support, you can't see and you can't hear, but she's there, um, uh, for giving their time this evening. And thank you to you all for joining us.